Good morning. Good to see you this wonderful Lord's Day. I got a question I'd like to ask you and see what your thoughts might be. Uh, <clears throat> I'm not going to pull you or anything like that, but I am going to ask this question. I mean, if Jesus came to church today, what would he say? Now, we hope he's here every Lord's Day, and we hope that we receive a message from him every Lord's Day. But, but I'm, I'm asking if he physically were to walk in these doors, and you know, he has his blue sash on, and he comes down the aisle, stands up here before you, and were to speak to you, what would he say to his church? You know, we've looked at uh, the churches in Ephesus and Laodicea last week, and we read the words of Jesus to those churches. And this week, we're going to be looking at the churches of Smyrna and Philadelphia. And like the churches of Ephesus and Laodicea, these two churches have an awful lot in common. And so we're putting them together. Last week at Ephesus, if you just go down the road about 35 miles, you find your way to a town called Smyrna. Now, there was a church at Smyrna. It was a struggling church. They were having a hard time because it was a place where there was a lot of persecution. And in fact, if you were a believer in Smyrna, you received the death penalty, which kind of becomes an obstacle when it comes to church growth. And, and so it was difficult time if you were a Christian in Smyrna. This, in Smyrna, it was an awful lot like Ephesus. It was a very wealthy city. Now, of all the cities that the Greeks built, Smyrna was probably the, the most impressive. Uh, they had wide streets going throughout the city. It was surrounded by hills. And, and there, was temp, there were different temples on top of these hills dedicated to, to different gods. There was an amphitheater in Smyrna that could seat some 20,000 people, maybe even more. And it was built and dedicated to the worship of the emperor. It was required for those who lived in Smyrna to worship Caesar as Lord. So the pastors at the church of Smyrna had a lot to deal with, if you think about it. Now, our tour guide through uh, this is John, and John was one of the pastors, and he knew another pastor, and this pastor's name was Polycarp. Polycarp would have probably been at about his mid-40s when John wrote this letter from Jesus to the church in Smyrna. Polycarp would have received this letter from John, and he would have stood up, and he would have read this letter to the congregation there in Smyrna. John was a mentor to Polycarp, and John was at Ephesus, and Polycarp there in Smyrna, and Polycarp had gone to Smyrna to be the pastor there, and he receives this letter from John, and he stands and reads this, and we pick up this letter here in Revelation chapter 2, verses 8 through 11, he says, To the angel of the church at Smyrna, write, These are the words of him who is the first and last, who died and came to life again. I know your afflictions and your poverty, yet you are rich. I know about the slander of those who, who say they are Jews and are not, but a, are a synagogue of Satan. Now, that's pretty harsh to, to say that they are the synagogue of Satan. And what's happening here is that there are people who are claiming to be Jews, and they really aren't Jews, and that's where a lot of the persecution was centered from. And, and there was a lot of persecution that was coming their way. Verse 10, we see where Jesus says, Don't be afraid of what you're about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you, and you will suffer persecution for 10 days. Now, the first week we talked about some different things with, with numbers and such like that. And the number 10 is kind of a complete number in, in Revelation. It's, it's a designated period. There is a beginning and there is an end. He says, be faithful to the point of death and I will give you your victor's crown. Or the King James says, a crown of life. Whoever has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And the one who is victorious 
will not be hurt at all by the second death. Now, the first death may sting. The first death may hurt, but you're not going to hurt at all by the second death. Now, this is one of two letters that were given to the seven churches where we read Jesus not saying anything critical or anything negative about the particular church. He, in fact, he's comforting these folks. He's, he's offering encouragement to this body of believers in Smyrna and Philadelphia who, who are being persecuted for their faith. Now, we have a very different tone in Jesus' voice here than what we studied last week. Last week, Jesus was writing to the churches of Ephesus and Laodicea. These two churches had compromised. They had kind of given into the cultural pressures of their day, and, and they've gone to the following the uh, you know what's the popular thing. And here Jesus was saying, he says, a lukewarmness is in your faith. And so last week he had a real harsh tone, and he he basically spanked him a little, and he says, look, you need to be hot or cold, but because you're neither, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. But this week the tone is a little softer because he's writing to a group of people. He's writing to churches who, who are being faithful, who are being persecuted because they are faithfully following Jesus. And these are still the words of Jesus, but the tone has, has changed a little bit. If you, if you have, you know, multiple children, you really understand how this works. One child can re require a harsh tone. Another child may not so much need that harsh tone. In fact, they, they might need a little bit more encouragement. They need a little bit more uh, help. And, and it all depends upon the challenges that they face and depends upon the child. It depends what they're going through and all of that kind of stuff. And that's what Jesus we have here is dealing with. Jesus is speaking to the, these churches and it sounds a, a little different this week than last. We've read these words to the church in Smyrna. Now, just flip the page over or look over to the next chapter. And in Revelation chapter 3, verses 7 through 12, we read, To the angel of the church at Philadelphia write these words. These are the words of him who is holy and true, who holds the key of David, who opens what he opens no one can shut, and what he shuts no one could open. He writes on in, in verse 8, I, I know your deeds and I see, I see how I've placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I, I know that you have little strength, yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. And I will make those who are of the synagogue of Satan, who claim to be Jews, though they are not, but are liars, I will make them fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. Since... You have kept my command to endure patiently. I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come on the whole world to test the inhabitants of the earth. And then verse 11, he says, I am coming soon. Now that's words that we've heard before and he's using them here again. He says, hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. The one who is victorious, I will make a pillar into the temple of my God. Never again will they leave it. I will write on them the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven from God, my God. And I will also write on them my new name. Whoever has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To both of these churches... They, they were suffering. And Jesus is saying, hold on to your faith. He's saying, I'm coming soon. I, you're not going to have to worry about the second death. Heaven is coming. I'm coming. Just hang on. Don't give up. Now, there are two words in particular that I want to draw your attention to. And it's these two little words, I know. Jesus said, I know. And what's interesting to me that if you study all seven of these churches, this phrase appears in all seven letters. Jesus says to all seven of these churches, I know. And he says it several times to the church in Philadelphia. 
Here's why I think this is significant. Sometimes we're not sure that he does. Sometimes we wonder, is he aware? Does he, does he really know what we are going through? Does he, does he really know the challenges that we face? Does he really hear my prayers and my pleadings? Does he really care about what is happening in my life? And in all seven letters, Jesus says, I know. I know. I know. Now, sometimes that's good news. Sometimes that's good news. I mean, if you're hurting and you need to be comforted, it's good to know that he knows. But if you're the church at Laodicea, if you're the church at Ephesus, you'd probably rather he didn't know. I mean, it would be better if you were unaware, if he were unaware of what's happening in your life. Sometimes you don't want somebody in authority to know. But sometimes those words make all the difference. Now, to those who have worked or who are working in the medical field, you all understand this. You've, you've had patients who, who've come in and they're getting ready for treatment, and, and then someone comes in and visits them, okay? They may not even know who this person is, but they're getting ready to go through treatment, and this person has been there, has experienced, has gone through the treatment, and they walk up to them and they say, I know what it's like. I know. And it seems immediately like there's just strength. There's strength because somebody else knows, and you know that they know, and that makes all the difference. Maybe you know a parent of a, of a special need child, and, and, and you don't know the struggles that they had to deal with with that child behind closed doors, and they just feel so overwhelmed, and, and they, really, they just really don't know what it's like to deal with constantly. And then they meet another family who has a child just like them. And what happens? They start to chatting and talking. And when they're talking, they start shaking their head. Yeah, yeah, I understand. I, I, I know what you're talking about. And, and they are strengthened because somebody else knows. When they know what they know, there's strength. Jesus says to the churches here, I know. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's not so good, and sometimes they feel very threatened because you find out that Jesus knows. Jesus knows the hidden sins of our lives. He knows the, the sins of our lives, the promises that we've had and, and made and we've broken. He knows the commitments that we've made and we haven't kept. He knows. and He knows that there are times when we are hurting and we are suffering. And Jesus says, I know. I know what it's like. Jesus comes to these churches who are suffering and he says, you know, I know. And you know what? We really shouldn't be surprised by that. Because when he says, I know, he is, he's showing us that he cares. And he's paying attention to, to what's going on. Look at, at verse 9. Verse 9 says, I know your afflictions and your poverty. Now, the word afflictions comes and could be translated uh, tribulation or suffering or troubles. The, the Greek word for affliction means to crush. It means to squeeze under great pressure. Jesus is actually using here a word picture because here is a word that would have been used at the wine press to describe what happens to the fruit. How they put the fruit on the press and how it is crushed and squeezed until every last drop of juice can come out. And Jesus is saying, that's how the church feels. This is what's going on. They are pressed. They are being crushed at every side. I know how you feel. And when you see the words like afflicted and poverty, you know, we t tend to, to base them on our own life's experiences. We think of our afflictions. We think of our poverty. And rightly so. And there's not a thing in the world wrong with that. But I do want to give you a little perspective when it comes to making those kinds of comparisons 
with our afflictions and our poverty to the afflictions and the poverty of the churches in Smyrna and Philadelphia. You see, some of you, or you know some, who have experienced afflictions because of their faith in Jesus Christ. You know, I've known people who've lost their jobs because of their faith in Christ. I've known students who've gotten lower grades because of their faith in Christ. I, I knew a, a man, stayed in his home, who, who had been blacklisted by the government in the country in which he lived. Blacklisted because he believed in Jesus Christ. He wasn't allowed to have a job. I, I recently heard of a guy who's whose wealthy family had written him out of their will because he became a Christian. And I realize that this is, is, is very real for some and to one degree or another, but, but we need to be clear here. What these churches experienced in Smyrna and in Philadelphia is on a different level than what we experience or any of us have experienced in our lifetime because you got to know they were talking about physical torture. They were talking about death. See, it's not common for us to experience on that level. Now, it may, it may be down the road. We, we, may, we just don't know. It could be down the road. But, but we, we don't have that experience to come draw from. I mean, if you, you read the news and you read world news, and you can... It doesn't take long before you'll run across an article like I did about a Christian village in Syria that was attacked by Syrian rebels. Or to find out that in North Korea right now there's some 30,000 Christians who are imprisoned, who are in concentration camps, and the life expectancy in these concentration camps is only about 10 years. But they are in these, these prisons because simply they believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and they will not renounce their faith. In Kazakhstan, there's a Christian mother. She was fined a month's salary because her nine-year-old son gave a teacher a Christian CD and at the front label of the CD said, Jesus loves you. She called the police. In Vietnam, local police confiscated 16 Bibles from a, a, a Bible study group that was meeting in a home. They told the leader, if you all meet again, we will come back and we will take you all to prison, and we will tear down your home. In Egypt, 70 Christian churches were attacked. A 10-year-old little girl was walking home from a Bible study, toting a Bible under her arm, and she was gunned down, killed for possessing a Bible. In the Sudan, the troops gathered up a group of Trish Christians, put them in a, a back of a flatbed truck, take them out to the desert. No supplies, no, no you know, uh, sustenance, sustenance of any type, no provisions. They're left there to fry in the desert. In Iraq, Christians have experienced increased persecution. One missionary who's identified only by the, his first name, William, writes to a church, his, uh, his home church, and he said, the hopes of Christians in Iraq is quickly fading. A mother writes, there are more bombs, more threats towards Christians. They send threatening messages via mobile phones. They throw letters into their houses. There's more fear. And many Christians in Baghdad simply stay inside because it's too dangerous for them to leave their homes. Now, to all of these examples, Jesus says, I know. I know. I know what that's like. See, we can't be unaware. I was reading about a Christian mission agency in South Asia. It's called Asian Access. And in this particular part of the world, persecution is just severe. But guess what? The church is also exploding in growth, which often is the case. And the church planners in that area are now trained to ask, 
those who want to become Christians, before they are baptized into Christ, before they can join their church and receive, be received in faith uh, by the other group of Christians, they are asking these new converts a series of questions and the, uh, that they have. And they come up with seven questions, seven questions for church planners. And this is the questions they ask. The first four are really pretty easy. I mean, they're tough, but they're easy, something that we could probably deal with. The first is, are you willing to leave your home and lose the blessing of your father, meaning you might lose your inheritance? The second question, are you willing to lose your job? How important is, this goes along with our question in Sunday school, how important is your faith to you? The third is, is this, are you willing to forgive those who persecute you and share the love of Christ with them? And the fourth is, are you willing to, to give an offering to the Lord? But here's where it gets tough. Question number five, are you willing to be beaten rather than to deny your faith? Question number six, are you willing to go to prison? And question number seven, are you willing to die for Jesus Christ? And if they're willing to do that, these brand new believers are given a slip, a slip of paper and they sign their name. And they understand that by signing this piece of paper that if they are caught, they will spend three years minimum in prison in hard labor. But the person, the church planner, the person that led them to Christ signs their name right beside theirs. And they understand if they're caught that they get six years in prison as a church, as a church planner. Now, those of us who have grown up in, uh, in, in Christian America, I mean, especially us in southwest Missouri, I mean, this is, is just not how we think of being a part of the church is, is it? For us, when we became Christians, it seems like we tried to make it as easy as possible. We tried to make it as easy as possible, as painless as possible. Somebody maybe at a youth conference, they were asked a question. Okay, hey, everybody, we're just going to ask you bow your heads and close your eyes. And if you want to become a Christian, raise your hand. And since we didn't want to embarrass anybody, we asked every head bowed, every eye closed. That way they could raise their hand and nobody really knew about it. Or they were asked, if you just repeat this, you don't even have to pray your own prayer. you got to re just repeat this prayer after me. Or, or we'll say, if you just walk down the aisle. Friends, we are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. It's not our works, nothing that we have done. And when we put our faith and trust in Jesus, we are surrendering. We are making a commitment to follow after him. Can we not be inspired by these brothers and sisters in Christ who are making these kinds of sacrifices and willing to, to give up everything because of their faith in Jesus? I, I think it should at least be translated into us being willing to say, hey, thank you. Thank you, Lord. Or, or being very prayerful. How about being challenged? You know, as I've been studying through different stories like these and, and thinking about this whole series and, and, and uh, messages. And, and then I've been also thinking about this COVID virus and how it's been an albatross around the neck of so many. And, and, I, and I, I've been thinking about its effect on our community. And, you know, there are churches in our community that are still not meeting. And this may not impact us because we've been here since Mother's Day again. And that's a great thing. We've been blessed, and I praise God for that. I praise God for that courage to, to step out and say, we're going to do what we can. But I also know that there are people who are struggling. And then I think about our country. I think about our society, and I think about the lack of integrity in our society and thinking about all that God wants to do through his church. And all the ways that he wants to use his church, this church, to impact this community, not just this community, but also the world. And then I start thinking, what could he do? How could he use us if we are just faithful to what he asks? 
You know, we act sometimes like it's a, a big deal and we even make apologies if we, you know, for asking somebody to give to something or asking somebody to serve on this and, and to help out with that. And we, we make, you know, make apologies, you know, oh, I'm sorry about it, but I need to ask kind of a thing. And we, you know, like it's a huge sacrifice when it's a privilege. It's a joy. It's a joy that we have in life to sacrifice, to give of ourselves. And I just, I just can't imagine what God could do with us as a church if we were so inspired by the Christians who are being persecuted around the world right now. You know what? I think it would come to the place where we would say, hey, I don't want to play it safe anymore. I don't want to be comfortable. I don't, I don't want to be afraid. I want to make sacrifices for my friends and for my neighbors. I don't know where that's going to lead, but I know that I'm good, and I'm good at, because I'm not going to have to deal with the second death. I don't have to fear. And I've been inspired by these challenges and these stories. And Jesus says to the church, I know. I know what you're going through. He says to the church of Philadelphia, you have a little strength. I know. I know. There was a preacher friend of mine who was talking about his first funeral that he did. He was about 21, 22 years old. And he did the funeral of a man who was 25 years old who was a, died of a drug overdose. The mother was a part of their church. She was a single mother and their only, her only child. And so he goes and, and visits. He said, I just didn't really know what to do. I was just young and, and wet behind the ears, but I just tried to encourage and comfort her in this desperate time in her life. He said, I was talking way too much. And she interrupted me, and, and, and here she is, a committed Christian, but she was, she was angry with God, and she was just trying to figure it all out. And, and so she, in her anger, she said, what does, what does God know about? And then she stopped the sentence. He said, I don't don't know what she was planning to say to finish the sins. I had no clue. He said, the thought came to my mind that she asked, what does God know about losing a son? He said, I don't know what she was uh, thinking. He goes, but I knew that she knew that he knew, and that's what makes the difference. And for those who are experiencing the pressures of life, who are feeling crushed, Jesus says, I know. And there are those who are having a hard time that we may know and come across that are having a hard time paying their bills and, and they worry about keeping their house. And Jesus said, hey, I know what that's like. I was poor too. I didn't have a, any place to lay my head when I was on the earth. Or they may feel that they can't catch a break. And Jesus said, I can relate. I was born in a manger in a barn stall, you know, and, and I was convicted of crimes I didn't commit. Some people say, you know, hey, I feel abandoned by my family and I don't understand that I really need them. I could use them. And Jesus goes, I know what that's like too. My, my mother and my brothers thought I had lost it. And then there was a time when my closest friends, my closest friends abandoned me when I needed them most. And Jesus goes, I know, I know. And he says to these churches, look, should you ever find yourself in a place where you're beaten and nailed to a tree? I know what that's like too. He says, I know you have little strength and I'm not oblivious to that. It hasn't escaped my attention. Verse 10, he says, and I think here's the challenge. He says, be faithful even to the point of death and I will give you the crown of life. To the church at Philadelphia, he writes in, in verse uh, 11 of chapter 3, he says, I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. He says, I know what you're going through. Be faithful. Hang on. Hang on to Jesus. I think it's interesting in chapter 2 there in verse 10. He says, don't be afraid of what you're about to suffer. Kind of seems a little backward to me. You know, it's very common for us to hear, don't be afraid or fear not in Scripture as a command. But, it's, you know, when you think, don't be afraid, I'm thinking, Jesus is saying, I'm going to come in and rescue you. Don't be afraid. It's almost over. But that's not what he says, is it? It's like the parent saying to the child, don't be afraid, but this is going to hurt. 
this just doesn't seem to match up with what we hear in our world today as far as a lot of the theology that's spewed out. A lot of junk theology out there. They'll say things like, uh, hey, look, if, if you're following Jesus, you're not going to suffer. You're gonna, he's going to fix everything in your life. Everything's going to go smooth. Everything's going to be fine. You're going to have plenty of money to pay all your bills, and you won't be sick. But that's not what Jesus says to this faithful church in Smyrna or this faithful church in Philadelphia, is it? He says, don't be afraid what you're about to suffer. You know, it's going to get worse before it gets better. But you got nothing to fear. You don't have to fear the second death. But things are going to be difficult. Pastor Fernando wrote a book called A Call to Joy in Pain. And he's a pastor in Sri Lanka. He ministers to a poor and persecuted group. And, and uh, he writes some observations about the American church and their view of suffering. This is what he says. The church in each culture has its own special challenges, theological blind spots that hinder, hinders Christians from their growth to full maturity in Christ. I think one of the most serious theological blind spots in the Western world is a defective understanding of suffering. There seems to be a lot of reflection on how to avoid suffering and what to do when we hurt, and we have a lot of teaching about escape from suffering and therapy for suffering but there is an inadequate teaching about the theology of suffering. The good life, comfort, convenience, and all uh, painless life have become necessities in America that people view as basic rights. And if they don't have these, they think somehow something is, has gone wrong, that God isn't holding up his end of the deal. One of the results of this attitude is the severe restriction of spiritual growth for God intends us to grow through trials you know this is one of the dangers in the church in America we start thinking that the Bible is all about us about making our lives better here and now I was in CPO the other day and there was a popular Christian book and author and the subtitle of his book said how to have effortless success that's the theme of his book, how to have effortless, 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 effortless. <laughs> it's hard to say, <laughs> effortless success. How do you measure that? I mean, how do you line that up with what Jesus is writing to these faithful churches here in Smyrna and Philadelphia? See, sometimes we want to think that this Bi the Bible is just the ultimate of self-help books. It's a self-help manual. And if we are just good boys and good little girls and God's going to bless us and everything's going to turn out and we won't have any problems with life. But that's not what he's promised, is it? In fact, he promised, Jesus said, in this world you'll have trouble. He then said, be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. That, that's what he promised and, and points then to the victor's crown. Our hope is in heaven. Jesus writes to the church at Philadelphia and he gives what I think is one of the most outstanding theological understandings of suffering. He says, I've placed before you an open door. That's how the Bible portrays trials. It's an open door. It's very consistent to what, what Paul talks about of suffering. It's an open door. It's an opportunity. It's an opportunity for our faith to be deepened. It's an opportunity for our faith to be demonstrated. It's an opportunity for us to glorify God. That's the perspective of Scripture that it gives us, that helps us, that when we come in, into trials, how we are to face them, and it's makes it easier for us to be faithful and hold on. Be faithful to the point of death. You can look in Christian history books and hear about Polycarp, the young man in his mid-40s when he got this letter. But the years come and go and experiences. Persecution doesn't, doesn't lighten up, lighten up at all. But Polycarp is 86 years of age still faithfully serving the Lord. There's a knock at the door and opens the door and there's a captain of the guard, Polycarp, a respected leader in the community. 
the captain says to him, just say Caesar is Lord. You don't have to believe it. Just say it. You don't have to mean it. Just say it. What we're about to do here doesn't have to happen. And Polycarp says, he's been my God for 86 years and he's never betrayed me yet. How could I now betray my Lord, my Savior, Jesus Christ? And so the pastor of Smyrna is led out to the amphitheater, brought before the Roman governor, who is in, he charges him with atheism, and he threatens him with being burned at the stake, trying to get him to recant once again. And Polycarp says, you've threatened me with fire, which burns for an hour, and after a little while, it's extinguished. Why delay? Bring it on while you will, what you will. And he was burned at the stake. And as the flames curled up around his body, people, it said, could hear him praying. And he wasn't praying for God's wrath. He wasn't praying for uh, deliverance. He prayed saying, God, thank you that you graciously thought me worthy of this day and this hour, that I may be part of the martyrs, numbered part of the martyrs, to die for Christ. And it's to this church in Smyrna that we read these letters. For the best and most concise theological understanding of suffering and hope, Paul gives us in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 10, he says, Through suffering our bodies continue to share in death of Jesus, so that, that the life of Jesus may also be seen in our bodies. Yes, we live under constant danger of death because we serve Jesus so that the life of Jesus will be evident in our dying bodies. We know, that we, we know that God, who raised the Lord Jesus, will also raise us with Jesus and present us to himself together with you. And as God's grace reaches more and more people, there will be great thanksgiving, and God will receive more and more glory. That's why we never give up. Though our bodies are dying, our spirits are being renewed every day. For our present troubles are small and won't last very long yet. They produce for us a glory that vastly outweighs them all and will last forever. So we don't look at troubles that we can see now. Rather, we fix our gaze on the things that we cannot see. For the things we see now will soon be gone, but the things we cannot see will last forever. Friend, that's our hope. Our hope is in heaven. Our hope is in Jesus Christ. This morning, I'd like us to finish and wind up a little different than we have and ever before, but I want us to stand with the churches around the world, the persecuted churches around the world, and just kind of read uh, a scripture. We're going to read from 2 Corinthians 4, 8 and 9 from the New Living Translation. And, and, and I just want us to stand and, and read these words aloud as, as we conclude. Would you stand with me, please? We are pressed on every side by troubles, but we are not crushed. We are perplexed, but not driven to despair. We are hunted down, but never abandoned by God. We get knocked down, but we are not destroyed. Let's pray. Almighty God, as a family here in Republic that freely gets to gather and Worship, we pray for our brothers and sisters around the world who are having to hide in basements or who are starving in prisons or who are having to visit their, their children's grave sites. God, I ask that you would just fill them with your hope. Lord God, I don't, I don't want us to walk out of here feeling guilty. I don't want us to walk out of here feeling shame. I, I want us to walk out of here feeling thankful and feeling inspired and feeling for the blessings that you've given us and inspired by those who have been so faithful through so much. Would you just help us, Lord, to have ears to hear? Lord, would you just wake us up so that we would want to accomplish, you would want to accomplish through this church and around the world. I mean, just help us to have a bigger vision of you, Lord. Help us to see the opportunity. Help us to see open doors of opportunity. Lord, help us to have a bigger vision 
of you, Almighty God. Not just for our community, but for around the world. That even though we're small, we, because of your power, can do mighty, mighty things. We just want to make ourselves available, God, and ask that you just have your way with us. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Sally's going to play for us. We're going to sing this song of decision. And if there is anyone who wants to talk about their relationship with Jesus or what it means to follow Christ, this is a hymn of decision for you. If you need prayer, come for prayer. If you need to make a decision, you do that as well. Let's worship together. You to just turn around. And I just probably we're going to forget everything. <laughs> this is Bonnie. And this is Darlene. That's right. And then this is Karen Blackmore. And they uh, come today as immersed believers in Christ. I've been in church with them before and appreciate them and their love for the Lord. And their, you know, I just want to ask that same question that I believe every Christian should want to ask, be answered. And that is, do you believe with all your heart that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God? Yes, sir. And can I ask you, do you believe with all your heart that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God? Yes. I know you do. (laughs) And do you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God? We praise God for that confession of faith and their willingness and wanting to be united with this body. I know that God's got great things in store for us. And as we see our lives blending together with others and, and just seeing his family grow, and we'll just, we need, we need one another. And I praise God for that. Thank you very, very much. And so welcome to, to Westside. Well, I'm glad you're learning more under you. Well, I appreciate that very, very much. Won't you all stand and let's, let's have a closing prayer. And we just praise God for, for these, but also want you just come and make certain that they feel Welcome. I'll put them on the, you know, uh, on the hot seat to try to remember everybody's name. <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh, it's great to be a Christian, isn't it? Amen. Almighty God, we thank you for this day. I thank you for, for these and this decision of theirs to come to be a part and unite their life with this fellowship. I thank you so very much for the testimony of their faith that's been seen throughout their lives. And, and Lord, I know I've been privileged to be able to see that. Father, I pray that you'll just help us as we continue to grow, as we strive to to be more like you, and that you would just help us to be an encouragement to one another. Thank you so much, Father, for, for loving us, and thank you for your word, and we just pray, God, that you'll just help us to be the people that you want us and have called us to be. For it's in Jesus' precious and holy name we pray. Amen. Don't forget the announcements in the bulletin and the events today. Guys, 5 o'clock, be a part of that. Have a great day. We're glad that you joined us for today's sermon. We trust that you have been blessed from this opportunity to be able to open and study God's Word together. If you have any questions that you would like answered, if you would like more information about the Christian life or how to become a Christian or Westside Christian Church, You can contact us at 417-732-6082 or email us at minister at westsidechristian.church. Thanks again for joining us at Westside today. Westside Christian Church is a church that truly loves God, loves others, and strives to be in service to all. Have a great day.